it is the ritual understanding of whether they are pure or impure and that is why by the way we nowadays there is a lot of discussion about it how cow urine is supposed to be pure whereas uh, many of the things that any rational mind would consider pure are supposedly ritually impure right so what happens in a caste trained mind that you will see even in uh, your ordinary exposure to uh, uh, your neighborhood or our own households that there is a, a puja going on a religious ceremony going on uh, the private space is supposedly sanitized by the by the priest and it becomes ritually pure but at the same time the entire household is located in a extremely filthy neighborhood but that is not really uh, you know it is not a matter of uh, concern for the caste trained mind because it's absolutely all right the private space sanitized by the priest is ritually pure and the public space is dirty filthy uh, uh, smelly stinky no problem so that is the distinction between private and public also explains why public spaces in india are often so disgustingly uh, filthy people don't care about uh, uh, you know how how they are dealing with the uh, the garbage disposal and other waste management in the public spaces but all of that becomes a very important point for them in the private spaces at least in the ritual sense the second and the more important point in my view is how this entire idea of purity and pollution then is brought down to individuals and how some certain individuals are then forced to participate in, in in activities of sanitation or cleaning work and things like that and because they are forced into it because because of their caste identity and because they are supposedly ritually impure and once they are forced into it then then you know the caste trained mind also then argues that look because you are indulging in sanitation work you are supposedly impure so it is a kind of a vicious uh, cycle that sanitation workers are often part of the recent studies have shown that uh, even even when sanitation workers have tried to come out of uh, sanitation work and applied for other types of jobs the larger caste society is unwilling actively unwilling to accept them uh, uh, as workers in general so you see how caste operates in this very vicious way especially for uh, uh castes which are supposedly ritually impure and so hence uh, um, uh, meant for working for sanitation right and when the other castes which are not part of those castes which are deemed to be ritually impure if they look at this operation of caste in this manner for them it becomes a question of preserving their own caste purity so any kind of interaction with public uh, cleanliness any kind of interaction with public sanitation an attempt to uh, take part in sanitation activities becomes a problem because then you realize if i take part in this my own caste status can may come under question and in that sense even basic civic sense in terms of uh, handling garbage handling basic sanitation activities in the neighborhood they are not only discouraged but in this caste sense stigmatized okay uh, next please the second uh, a more important uh, for public health point of view is the notion of public solidarity now of course recently it has become uh, somewhat of a discussion a lot of people are talking about it because of covid 19 that uh, covid 19 was of course uh, uh, devastating for all of us but what was really even more brutal in my in my view was the uh, absolute indifference even contempt of the ruling class towards the sufferings of the ordinary people and the question is why is it why is it that you know uh, this happened and uh, nobody really nobody really uh, the, the most that, that the ruling class and even upper caste middle class people could do was to think about some charitable charitable activities and there was still no discussion about structural changes that can be brought in and i would argue again that this is because our society is a caste society is it is constituted by castes and what is a caste according to dr ambedkar castes are basically inward looking anti social anti national entities 
and they are like that because they are defined by the way these are terms these are phrases used by dr ambedkar himself anti social anti national inward looking selfish so this is not my addition and he says every single caste is anti social because they are only concerned about their own welfare their own interest there is no conception of a common interest or a common welfare goal that has to be achieved as a society right more than that dr ambedkar has these two concepts i would say that uh, are very important and very useful to understand why indian public health system has not been able to develop in the same manner as other societies despite having much more resources and things like that the first concept that uh, i would like to present here uh, which is the concept of social endosmosis by the social endosmosis is a concept that dr ambedkar draws from uh, his teacher dui the great educational theorist and a philosopher of uh, and a founder pioneer of uh, pragmatism as a as a philosophical school Uh, remember that uh, dui uses the term social endosmosis only once in his entire body of work but dr ambedkar takes that concept and makes a variety of creative use of this term to explain a lot of things about the caste society in india so that is that is just an aside you know dr ambedkar takes this idea from dui dui uses it only once but dr ambedkar uses it in so many ways in so many different places to understand make sense of and explain the caste society what is social endosmosis it's a very simple but a very powerful idea it says that in every society there should be possibilities avenues channels through which different social groups can talk to each other what do they talk about they talk about not only ideas but also experiences different social groups should be able to talk about experiences their aspirations their aims and if that happens then the society can then move forward and a common shared interest can emerge now what happens in a caste society especially for castes which are supposed to be lower in the hierarchy is the opposite of social endosmosis and the opposite of social endosmosis is social isolation so according to dr ambedkar what is happening here is that rather than social endosmosis dalits in particular are victims of social isolation that their interests their experiences their aspirations their aims are unheard by the larger caste society and that is because and that because that happens uh, you see a, a a number of things things can be explained social boycott of dalits happen in in villages cases of extreme violence against against dalits happen for for uh, reasons uh, like you know if you, you try to buy a new motorcycle and all of those things happen and the caste society is completely unperturbed and the, the thing is dr ambedkar says they will be unperturbed because there is no a way in which empathy can be created between these two groups because there is a block there is a block in communication there is a block in exchange of experiences right now this you can say is there in every society to a certain degree in in the west also you have these kind of uh, problems of endosmosis based on race and other things but dr ambedkar goes even further and he has this other concept called social nausea and he says not only is there social isolation but there is also a social nausea that caste society holds for certain groups and social nausea is basically a sense of disgust a sense of contempt so you not you will never allow not only you will not allow a possible opening of a channel of communication of experiences you will you will hold certain groups in such deep contempt that any kind of welfare activities any kind of policy that may benefit the other side is personally offensive to you right this is the kind of nausea and disgust you hold next please some examples just to clarify this is too conceptual and also very little time so first is very clear the entire idea of caste society is the antithesis of the idea of public in public health and this is a very often quoted a uh, quote from the annihilation of caste 
where Dr. Ambedkar says, the effect of caste on the ethics of the Hindus is simply deplorable. Caste has killed public spirit. Caste has destroyed the sense of public charity. Caste has made public opinion impossible. So, of course, one of the implications of this is that the ruling class will actively prevent any kind of progressive social reform. For example, uh, choice marriage, for example, uh, uh, you know, many other uh, reforms in society, and of course, eventually annihilation of caste itself. Also in public policy, uh, even a, a, a policy like Narega or National Food Security Act, which in a way is see, seems to benefit the Dalit workers, rural workers, is something that is offensive to to urban classes uh, the, who, 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 who believe that they are part of the ruling class. And so they will object to all this. But there is also this completely unexpected effect that uh, uh, social isolation and social nausea has on the larger society as a whole. And that is that basically because you are you don't allow any kind of public policy or any kind of social reform to take place which will in your view in the caste society's view benefit uh, the socially isolated groups you are also in a way holding back to any kind of reform that will benefit everyone and in that sense everyone is harmed in this process of uh, uh, the the operation of social isolation and social nausea. Uh, next, please. So, in, in in this very popular movie on on health, Michael Moore uh, called Sicko, Michael Moore is interviewing in a sequence uh, a conservative politician from Canada, and uh, Michael Moore asks him that you you belong to the conservative party, why do you support uh, public health? because uh, you know you are a reasonable young healthy politician why do you pay for somebody else who, who is uh, who is ill who is elderly so it's like you are paying for somebody else you know this is this is uh, not good and uh, you know it's a very interesting response that uh, he receives from a member of the conservative party in canada he says that that person responds and he says that eventually if you think about it I don't pay for others when you pay for public health. Actually, I pay for myself. And everyone who is part of a public health system is basically paying for himself or herself. It is, it is not an act of charity. Participating in public health systems is not an act of charity. It is an act of selfishness. But the thing is, uh, when you apply this to a caste society, the caste society and the principles of purity and pollution and the principles of social isolation and social nausea does not allow the caste society to even seek welfare for itself. That's the ironic and the strange and uh, I would say eventually an unwelcome outcome for everyone, right? And that is why there are so many examples, uh, manual scavenging, poor sanitation conditions of slums and ghettos are supposedly problems for the poor for the caste society and not everyone. But remember, poor sanitation in cities like Mumbai or Delhi, uh, hub of dengue and malaria and all kinds of other infectious diseases is a health problem for everyone. And my favorite example I always, <laughs> I always tell is the example of how uh, the great film director Yash Chopra died. Yash Chopra uh, died of dengue. You know, so no amount of uh, money and no amount of, uh, uh, you know, being part of gated communities can actually help you if they, you exist or you live in a society which is marked by these kind of unsanitary conditions. Okay. And recently you have seen in COVID-19, uh, the lockdown was announced completely suddenly without providing any time to any person to go back to their hometowns or even uh, uh, find some other livelihood. And in a way, this also shows how the ruling classes, uh, which by the way, according to Dr. Ambedkar is comprised of the Brahmins and the Baniyas, are completely unaware or unsympathetic to the livelihood conditions and the life conditions of the ordinary uh, worker in, in, in the town. And that is why you simply went on for a complete lockdown with the 24-hour notice 
and you, it did not occur to you that you know there are so many people who are working in all kinds of conditions where will they go what will they do right and the social nausea element again in covid 19 we have seen it how certain communities certain groups were supposedly labeled as carriers of the coronavirus and things like that next please i think i have only four or five minutes left uh, aditi can you uh, megna can you just tell me how much time do i have i have only two three sides slides left now uh, uh okay, Kumar, yeah, i think you, i think you can uh, there is time so you can continue okay great so uh, and the final point uh, which is, I said, the recent learning that we have from uh, from uh, recent research on public health in South Asia is about gender. And it's a very important learning that we have. Bangladesh has improved on nutrition, on sanitation, because of improvement in gender relations in Bangladesh, right? So, uh, and also some other societies in South Asia and other research that has taken place in South Asia. And all of them collectively say that the low status of women in society is the reason why India has and South Asia has the problem of uh, undernutrition among women, among children, among and many other many other problems that we have identified earlier. Now, my my only problem with this entire literature is that gender relations in this literature somehow exists on its own whereas if you are a student of caste and Indian society if you're a student of Indian society in general forget about caste for a while I, I think if you begin studying the society in India there is no way you can you can think about gender without thinking about caste it's impossible right and in fact, uh, I would even dare say that Brahminical patriarchy that is operational in, in a society like India, caste society like India, is not the routine <laughs> patriarchy. It is not the simple patriarchy that exists everywhere else. Because as Dr. Ambedkar in his very early, and I think the first uh, uh, academic uh, uh, contribution he casts in India, I'm talking about, he, 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 he argues, he proves it uh, through his historical study, anthropological study, that women are central to the maintenance of caste society, especially in terms of maintaining caste endogamy and control over women's sexuality, over their bodies, over their sexual behavior, their, their marriage, their uh, chastity, very, very important for maintaining of uh, endogamy and the entire structure of caste society. So I think it's very clear that women and women's sexuality, their decisions about their bodies, their marriage, their, uh, you know, childbirth or no, not to have childbirth and things like that. All of this is determined by the overall structure of caste. So I don't know how it is possible to talk about caste, gender without talking about caste. And so one of the things that I think is limiting in, uh, in the recent research on public health and uh, in India and South Asia and how it goes halfway, but I would say not the full way. And the full way is recognition of gender caste and Brahminical patriarchy as the driving force of Indian society. And if you take this position, then the implications for public health are absolutely clear. Women have low nutrition. Uh, in the household, within the household, I'm not talking about generally, because they have a lower status even within the household. They have higher work workload, but their uh, labor force participation rates are one of the lowest in the world, actually even comparable to West Asia and North Africa. Uh, women have very limited control over decisions regarding their own bodies, like I said about sexuality, about choice marriage, about childbirth or uh, 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 child spacing or various other things that have a direct impact on public health outcomes. And finally, uh, as is, I think, quite well known, but again, the, I think the linkage, the structural linkage between Brahminical patriarchy and this should be highlighted even more is the question of violence against women, which is a public health uh, issue, right? Uh, next, please. 
so yeah so this is my just final 5 minutes uh, going back to the indian uh, enigma uh, ramalinga swami has this very interesting way in which they they approach the answer to their to, to, to their question about why uh, south asia especially india despite very high levels of economic growth have not been able to achieve decent quality of nutrition education health sanitation and things like that and they say before they come to their answer which is gender relations they say south asia's high rates of child malnutrition is not to be found in the obvious i i find this very and that's why i have put it here in the, one of the final slides i find this very a uh, very striking way uh, a very sharp way to question some of our deeply held beliefs about what is wrong with indian society and especially in terms of health and education and the other fields of very important life parameters life indicators and so for example i am asking three four questions here you know why is it that india still has very very wide prevalence of tb in the world uh one of the standard answers that you you get from all kinds of sources despite their very different ideological persuasions in every other way is poverty Uh, why are so many people again official data does not recognize this but based on social movements and uh, organizations they have documented a lot of hunger deaths starvation deaths in india why answer poverty why do indian women have exceptionally high rates of anemia this has now slightly become uh, uh, the answer has become less of poverty and more of uh, gender because of recent research but look at the last one child labor in india why is india among the only middle income high income countries in the world where child labor is so prevalent i don't even have to cite a study to prove that child labor is so prevalent because we see it all around us all the time now why is that so why why is it that children uh, are forced to work at such young age and not go to school answer is poverty but uh, i think many of you may are already be aware of this classic work by maren wiener uh um, called child and the state in india where he he actually took this hypothesis that child labor in india is because of poverty and went around discussing talking doing interviews of different sections of the population policy makers educationists school principals ngo walas and then uh, he came out with the answer that actually child labor is so pervasive in india not because of poverty but because of this deep seated belief across the board across different sections of the population uh, despite an overriding their ideological preferences and things like that uh, across the board belief is that there are basically two types of people in the world one who think and the one who go and do hard work and you know based on that again i mean of course i i i said it to just to create a uh, uh you know some sort of act anticipation the answer is of course caste which creates this entire belief system whereby you say that uh there are two sorts of uh, uh, classes in the world one who who are, who are who deserve to do mental work who deserve to do uh, more refined activities and there are some other people who who deserve to uh, be part of uh, uh, hard work hard labor from their younger days and uh, one of the most striking findings of myron wiener is that he says that this is held as a deep belief by almost everyone there is nobody who is outside of this belief system and that i think is very important to understand i think i don't think this uh, the, this finding has been appreciated enough by social scientists and social policy uh, scholars and public health scholars in india that despite all kinds of otherwise very thriving ideological political system in india the idea that there are some children who are working every day 24/7 uh, you know very very distressful very very bad working conditions they should be in school they should be a compulsory act that will put them into school uh, that is not found desirable almost by anyone in the kind of interviews that maran wiener did, did right so i think uh, this is another way to just say that caste is so central to all of these answers uh next please final um, yeah 
so this is my final slide uh, like i said recently uh, uh, two of the most uh, influential uh, public health ethics scholars coglin and justin they asked these two fundamental questions and they said what makes health public is a more philosophical question whereas how do we make health public is a more activistic question my submission today based on this very brief and i'm sure the inadequate uh, discussion today uh, given the time constraint my submission is that in the case of india which is a caste society in the same way as defined by dr ambedkar and other scholars the philosophical and the activity they both collide into one and that is why this uh, moral reasoning and persuasion against caste which is supposed to be a philosophical activity in uh, in cogan and justin i think is quite activist in india and i think i have demonstrated enough that in public health literature in the recent time and also in other questions of public interest like uh, uh, you know sanitation nutrition and even uh, education primary edu- compulsory primary education child labor caste has been erased and uh, uh, a more uh, poverty oriented analysis has been understood to be the final answer to all of this so i think even speaking about caste in public policy even speaking about caste in public health matters is activity and not simply philosophical and uh, caste and gender that is brahmanical patriarchy is a public health issue the operation of social isolation and social nausea it should be our attempt to uh, reason with everyone in this society that this basically harms everyone bad public health harms everyone uh, and this this should be our position this, this should not only be our intellectual position but also our activist position this should be our uh, way in which we uh, reason with people persuade other people to join our side uh, into this public health debate and i i i i leave on a very positive note uh, by highlighting this no i don't think this was highlighted enough again in the media but last year in october the new york city board of health declared racism as a public health crisis and they said that you know in covid 19 it has become even more clearer that uh, uh, a black individual uh, or a minority individual uh the propensity of that individual to catch covid and die of covid is higher than uh, uh, a white individual now of course at the superficial level you will say this new term that all of us have become uh, very familiar with underlying conditions so you will say the underlying conditions are very important and in the document that was shared by the board of health they talk about all this they say that yes of course the underlying conditions are important but the question is why is it that the black community at large and black individuals have worse underlying conditions than the white individuals and white communities and that is because of structural factors like racism so ultimately according to them we don't have to look at the superficial realities we have to find and identify the final deep reality which is the structural cause which is racism and so in public health discourse in public health policy making they said racism has to be figured in as the most important uh, idea and the most most important factor and uh, so can we work towards making caste and brahmanical patriarchy uh, or a public health identified as a public health crisis in india that is the question uh, i leave you with uh, thank you very much i hope it was useful and i thank again the bahujan economists for inviting me to deliver this talk